Hello? Oh, this is Chuck. Yeah, hi. Um, I mailed my slides. I think we, you, we both mailed our slides to BP. I assume he was going to come on and and show them, or otherwise we'll just uh, you know share our screens individually. Screen sharing works better for me. Okay, fine. That, I mean, about the screen sharing, switching who shares the screen actually triggers some bug in, I think it's primarily if you're on the uh, browser version with uh, you know, sometimes the screen sharing doesn't work after you switched it around for some reason. Yeah, uh, given how long the de the delay is uh, the audio delay is it just is very awkward to ask someone else to run the slides. I think most of the delay is actually in the time it takes until you see the screen <laughs> update from that the person switched the. So, but anyway, yes, I know it, there's a huge pain in that delay. So, uh, we can try. Hopefully, not many will be affected. Yeah, one thing we could try to is that the ones who's actually presenting could actually have their video on because I don't think we're if if they have enough up and capacity etc. Because that uh, makes it a bit easier for, usually for people to follow along, see the presenter. But that's if you're willing and able. <laughs> yeah, I can do that.
Okay, uh, since this is now one o'clock, I guess I have to start with the uh, note well and ter tell everybody that, uh, hey, whatever you say here is an IATF contribution and be aware of that fact. I guess that's about it. That's not five minutes. Uh, we do have five minutes for agenda bashing. Is there anyone who wants to say anything about the agenda? Yeah, I would like to say something. This All right, is if not. Yes, I would like to say something. Would you? This, is, this Go ahead. is Chuck. Yeah. And there does seem to be a significant audio delay here. Um, <clears throat> there's one item that's not included on the agenda. I'm not asking to change that right now, but I just wanted to mention that I am working on computational storage and continuing that, that work. Um, and that does fall in, in the category of, of uh, um, future work items. Um, there hasn't been a an urgent need to present that to the working group. It's just sort of an FYI, and there is a uh, a personal draft on the data tracker if people are interested in looking at. That's all. Uh, have you updated that recently, or is or uh, intend to I, do that, or should I, I, don't, I should just go back and read it? Um, go have a look. Uh, I'm intending to update it again. There are some some ideas that I wanted to put into it. Right now, it's just basically a pile of ideas uh, related to computational storage and, and NFS, how we might implement it in NFS. Um, so if you're not interested in computational storage, I don't think it's probably going to be very interesting or, or legible. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to continue to update it. Okay, good. So I guess first up is uh, is 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 now uh, if, if we're done with the agenda stuff. Are we recording? Maybe first up is is Soren. Are we recording? I started it. Yes. Okay. Is there someone taking minutes? Uh, I don't know. Don't think I can because I need to focus on presentation. Brian, uh, will move this one. I don't know. My first presentation is uh, an idea in the okay. How do I take control? Can anybody do that at all? I can, I can barely hear you, Soren. You're very muffled. Can anybody oh, that's better. give me the control? Yeah, I was behind my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can anybody give me control? So how does it work? Oh, I can. Can I take the wall? Let's see. I think you should be able to, but I'm trying, but it doesn't want to share your screen. It doesn't want to let me move. Uh, if yeah. David, if you give the ball to Sorin. Yeah, I think that keep... was yeah. Whoever has the host role uh, can do it. Yeah, I I, I cannot. I'm trying, but I cannot. Is there another way to maybe here in the maybe another way? Yeah, I think uh, Dave Novick needs need, needs needs to do what is colloquially called yeah, tossing the ball. Make you 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 need to make Soren a you need to make Soren a presenter. Grab the ball in the in the participant list and okay, drag it over see. to where where is that? Uh, the participant, participant list. Or? 
So view yeah. the participant. Oh, in the participant list. Okay, okay, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, allow change role to presenters. That should be it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, ball jumps. Okay. He's got the ball now. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, and I'm going to right. Okay, so uh, I put together a set of slides uh, based on a draft. That... Uh, slides aren't slides aren't coming up yet. Have you got them shared, Simon? Okay, wait a second. But how do I do this? Share it should be in the here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. I didn't share. I didn't push the button yet. <laughs> so I'm gonna share this one, right? There we go. Soren is starting to share content. You look like, looks like you may have some bandwidth problems, Soren. So you have to be patient with us. One second, one second. So this is what I want to share, right? Do you see anything different now? Yes. Okay. We're good. That's good. Um, it looks like you're in a little bandwidth connection to Soren, so when you change slides, you may have to wait a few seconds for the bits to propagate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I learned how to do this because I didn't uh, let me to come up. Okay, so uh, this is a draft that uh, we I was recommended to uh, start working on by the working group. The last meeting in, uh, I think it's Montreal, was when we decided. And uh, there is a draft that I uh, worked together with David, and mostly David, uh, to clean it up. But uh, we wanted first to present the, the, the status, and then uh, we'll decide uh, when to post the draft. And uh, we would like a review of the draft, but first we have to discuss. So this draft is a uh, collaboration between the Myself, David Black, and uh, Christophe was kind enough to review, start reviewing the slides. So uh, I don't know if he's in the call today, but uh, he, he's with us. So at least one, this one important point for us because we, uh, are, you know, I we used some of his older drafts. So they were expired, but uh, we, we thought that it's uh, appropriate for him to uh, be involved. So he is. I'm happy to. Okay, now I will wait a few seconds and uh, you tell me if you're if it's you're here. Okay, good. So, uh, what's the motivation? Uh, the motivation is to add support to new NVMe transport protocol for PNSS. Uh, NVMe over fabric is uh, a fabric extension of NVMe for non volatile memory express SSD interface. New storage systems support NVMe over fabric. We started to support at least several uh, vendors to do that to access NVMe based storage. The NVMe devices are faster than older SCSI, of course, but connecting them uh, using all transport uh, will be inefficient and it will uh, defeat the purpose of, of uh, speed and, and uh, you know. So that means that new faster transports are needed. Um, memory of storage servers may use persistent memory, and that complicates some of the issues because if you have persistent memory, uh, you probably have uh, uh, consistency issues. So we need to address those. A new hosts can access remote persistent memory using RDMA. Uh, what we are trying to do in this draft is extending the PNFS to NVMe support, right? How to extend uh, the current PNFS from SCSI to NVMe? That's the goal of our uh, draft. The transports used to connect of NVMe over fabric based servers instead of SCSI exist already and uh, they are defined in the NVO fabric protocol. NVMe fabric transports uh, could include fiber channel, RDMA, iWarp, especially undated PCP. And uh, we are looking at uh, PCIe, but it's not clear yet if uh, we want to uh, include that, although uh, Christophe is interested in that, I, we still thinking. PNFS needs NVMe loud support for all this new NVMe over fabric transport. That's what the goal of our draft. Uh, 
Uh, so we start from we started from uh, BNFS SCSI layout and extend to support NVMe on that uh, layout type. Draft introduces NVMe details for PNFS server and client. Uh, there is a, a difference in this type of uh, of uh, storage. Uh, the difference is that in principle you can uh, have the clients and the servers host being on the same fabric and they can actually uh, transfer data both ways which is different a little bit than before PNFS. okay so how do we expand pnfs to support NVMe? so pnfs scasi layout rfc 8154 allows pnfs clients to direct perform ios to the block storage devices by passing the mdm right that's uh, the the starting point this draft adapts the PNFS SCSI layout to enable use of NFS over fabric, provides fiber channel RDMA or TCP access for devices using NVMe or fabric, enable implementers to start from the PNFS SCSI layout known and uh, the NVMe standards currently NVOF 1.1 and NVMe 1.4 to implement PNFS NVMe layout. References the NVMe over fabric transport specifications for uh, fiber char RDMA and TCP. Uh, we don't believe that all the three will be equally evenly implemented by implementers, but uh, we want to be sure that we cover all the things. We believe that the future will be TCP. But again, uh, this is uh, initial. What is needed from PNFS server? Okay, good. Uh, so, first of all, it requires the PNFS storage devices to support the underlying NVMe over public transport to provide reliable NVMe commands and data delivery. That's the uh, first critical point, which uh, needs to be, uh, it depends on the architectures, and we will discuss in a second. NVMe over fabrics architecture and commands used by PNFS clients uh, to access PNFS storage device. Uh, these commands should be recognized by the fabric. Uh, layers are shown in the diagram. So you can see in the diagram. Can you see my pointer or? Okay, anyway. So uh, the, the PNFS host SCSI, la SCSI layout over NVMe talks to the NVMe over fabrics, the transport binding, then NVMe transport service, and uh, then the next layer is NVMe transport and fabric protocol, physical fabric, and then the layout. So this is the uh, the current uh, proposed uh, configuration according to the specs of uh, NVMe over fabric and NVMe. That I you know that's the was the hardest part for me is to collapse to see what pieces are strictly necessary. Uh, I'm not hundred percent sure that I this is perfection, but that's the current thinking. And uh, well. To open to do that. Now, okay. so uh, in any case, we want to focus so as, as the media is so fast. Of course, it would be uh, reasonable uh, to uh, assume that we want to use some kind of RDMA transfer protocol for PNFS and FSD port. Uh, the NVMe uh, port ID supports multiple NVMe over fabric transports. If more than one transport is supported by the underlying network fabric. So, in principle, it could support iWarp, Rocky, or both. The diagram illustrates, again, we're focusing on these three, these two, but uh, it's just the, our first uh, draft. The diagram illustrates the layering of the RDMA transport and common RDMA providers, iWarp, Infiniband, and Rocky V2, with the host and NVM subsystem. So, you can see. In the diagram, the NVMe host is connected to the, to the RDMe. RDMA could use either iWarp, Infiniband, or Rocky uh, through the RDMA fabric, which again, it's, there could be any of them. So it's like the diagram shows either of them uh, or all together with different hosts. And then the RDMe, uh, RDMA transport, and this talks to the NVMe subsystem. Uh, separate some TCP and FC transports are not shown, but uh, they are uh, 
we we're considering them uh, depending on you know we, we don't know yet what implementers will prefer so i think we want to keep these things the spec the the, the the draft we've written to support all the transports the the, the diagram just just shows our dma so we don't we don't clutter with all the examples yeah. so uh, uh in, um, we have to share the the draft, um, and we have discussed about it a little bit. Right? The draft is is available, but it's not uh, to the point that we want. We are completely sure that we we put the right thing, all the right things that need to be there. So that's why we're trying to learn a little bit from this discussion, and then uh, we will uh, uh, post it and we'll open for discussion again. So NVMe or Fabric allows multiple PNFS clients to connect to different controllers on the same subsystem, PNFS storage device, right? So you may have multiple hosts, multiple PNFS clients that could uh, talk on the same subsystem to multiple devices on different MDFs. An association established between the host and the controller when the host connects to a controller admin queue. So, uh, this all this is established at the beginning before you start uh, using it for the, the transfer transports you have to have this uh, cre creating the queues which is maybe a little bit different than previous uh, um, uh, media and previous uh, uh, controllers the pfs client also acts as an nvme host and nvme controls are used as the pfs storage device uh, what, what means this is because they are connected to the same fabric. In principle, uh, the, it is a, a possible with the NVMe fabrics to move either way. So it could be either using the push or the pull model from the perspective of the RDMA connection and, and transport. PNFS clients may connect to PNFS storage devices using different network protocols, as I mentioned before, and different NVMe over fabric transports. And in principle, there should be no conflict uh, using multiple. Uh, but um, again, this is a part of the, what, what we want to, to uh, assert in the draft. The NVM subsystem may require a host to use fabric secure channel, NVMe in-band authentication or both. So that's an important point because now there is a, this free uh, movement between the uh, clients and the server. It is a potential uh, for uh, clients which are not uh, you know, uh, allowed to connect to connect directly and mess up with the data in the server, which did, was less possible before. Now it's more open for that. So that's why we need to be sure that we implement the secure channel fabric uh, uh, in this environment. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the little details. So volume that identification. Uh, PNFS SCSI layout uses SCSI device identification VPD page to identify the devices used by the layout. And we will continue to go on this path. NVMe over fabric storage devices need to provide analogs, unique identifier based on UI64 and NGUID identifier. We'll have to work out on these details. We have some ideas, but uh, in the draft, but I, I think we, we are not yet. Uh, sure what the implementer's uh, path will take. Uh, UID identification could be added, but must use a large enough enum value to avoid conflict with possible future SCSI changes. So what's happening is that we need to uh, prepare for a wider, because as you understand, uh, connection between on a large fabric could happen, right? So we have a large number of hosts and the large number of servers on the same fabric. So uh, I, I, we believe that we may need more uh, more bits. Um, and David, correct me I'm, if I'm wrong. So, um, so what, what's going on with the UUID is that it turns out that in the actual SCSI layout, the identifier numbers um, have a really nice correspondence to SCSI standards. There's no UUID in the SCSI standards. And so the trick is to use an enum value uh, that stays out of the way of SCSI possibly doing something useful in the future we might want, we might want to pick up. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's a wider possibility, but we need to be sure that we address it properly in the draft. And uh, that's why we, we assume that there's the path, but we, we want to, uh, because there's the registration too, so I, 
Well, we don't have to figure out. Hey, Soren, hang on for a minute. Mart Mart Martin's in the queue. Uh, wants to say something. Oh, I didn't see that. Uh, I'm sorry. This, maybe I just missed it in the slide, but I don't think these slides are uploaded anywhere. Is there is there an actual draft online somewhere that we can read about this book? Not yet. I wish there was. I um, uh, I have lots of reasons, including the TSUWG adventure that you and I are involved in that, that have been, been, been diverting my time elsewhere. Right. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, uh, I was like you saying before that the, we have a draft zero zero, but we wanted to have the discussion first to see if we are going in the right direction, and then we update the draft. Uh, but the, the plan is to have it by uh, June. Uh, upload it. Of course. We can, if there are sections that we are, you are interested, we could share some sections. Again, it's not complete and it's not perfect. So that's why we prefer to, to do the right path because we want to get a faster path to the working group acceptance. So it's better not to uh, put wrong things that will start a lot of discussions. Well, just personally, I'm, I'm interested in just getting some general background on this problem. I, I... I think it might apply to some use cases, but I, I was just hoping to, frankly, read, read the context of it more than more than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to wait for the draft. Thanks. We we we, uh, we appreciate very much that, and we want people to. But uh, you know, we were. And, and, and Martin, I appreciate your, your 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 willingness to wait. We can send you what you have now. It might cause as much confusion as clarity because it's very much very much a work in progress. That's the problem. That if you are open not to criticize us too much. Well, just bring your opinion, we, we can share, but again, uh, I, we don't want to confuse you. That's the problem, the biggest problem we have, right? And I think that it's very important for many people, that's why the working group asked us to take over this draft. So I, I want to respect that. So, I mean, we want, not only me. Uh, SCSI layout uses persistent reservations to provide client benefits, right? Both the MDS and the PLFS clients have to register a key with the storage device. And the MDS has to create a reservation on the storage device. We discuss a bit more in the draft about this. So uh, it's just uh, sharing what, what we're looking at. To allow fancy individual systems, each system must use a unique persistent reservation key. Because as I said, if you can have multiple type of fabrics accessing the same uh, uh, storage, same uh, devices, it could be uh, making the things complicated when there is persistent reservation or, uh, is done because, you know, there will be conflicts in who's want to modify certain area. The MDS must generate a key for itself. And that's um, something that it needs to be in the protocol. And the key for each of the PNFS clients that access the SCSI layout volumes before exporting a volume. So that's important because without this, the access to remote uh, persistent memory is complicated. And of course, there are, uh, we can, of course, prevent any maldoing, but it's, it's better to have a reservation key controlled by the MDS. That's at least what I, uh, my, my thinking was. Uh, the reservation key applies to all access by individual PFS clients, regardless of fabric, regardless of, 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 of uh, volume. So it, it's, that's why it's important to have a safe mechanism because otherwise you end up with, because the fact that, that each of the clients can access the memory of every other client and all the, to the fabric makes uh, more difficult uh, fencing. Okay, so uh, for the NVMe uh, fencing uh, specifically, we have some other uh, additional, uh, uh, you know, complications that call them, or not complications, different. NVMe reservation is similar to SCSI persistent reservation, which from that perspective is good. But as, as you know, the persistent reservation in SCSI can only uh, connect two entities. Uh, and multiple MVMs cannot, will have to uh, adhere to the protocol. MVS registration reservation, it's done, of course. Uh, but the PNFS client uh, registration is a little bit more complicated. Multi host reservation you. Uh, exclusive access and all registrants. So it's a different, a little bit more, diff more complex and more uh, comprehensive, let's call it, than the current uh, reservation. Uh, there are fancy fencing actions that won't change much. Of course, we have to adapt to the protocol, to the transfer, but transport, but uh, pretty much the MDS preempt the client registration to fence clients. 
and uh, re reservation acquire, com acquire command is re required, which means that it needs to create re regenerate a key in case that the uh, host uh, may not use the same key uh, at the later time because otherwise we wouldn't know if it was already uh, preempted. So registration preemptions remove client for reservation and denies access, but uh, which means that if you try to reconnect, you cannot use the same uh, key. Client recovery after fencing. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, this is typical. It's not something new, but uh, it's clear in this case that uh, the client must meet all layout because the data could be accessed by the remote side. So that's why it's important to commit and not uh, to, you know, to kind of freeze uh, the current situation when you disconnect. Uh, future, future get device info calls may require new PNFS client registration, which I, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, one more topic which is important uh, is volatile write caching. Because uh, in this case, because of persistency, uh, we may have uh, additional conflict. But how, how do I do with the time? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to uh, be short. Um, so we carry SCSI layout volatile write cache to port forward to NVMe, which is okay. PNFS server is required to commit cache to stable storage on layout commit. That's kind of a little bit different. Because uh, it's uh, actually, actually we're, we're doing the same thing. What's, what's different is just the flush command uh, is using a VME instead of SCSI synchronized cache. Yeah, the flush, I also but I, I spoke to before the, the, the bullet. So, the, for the flush command analogous to SCSI synchronized cache command is uh, solving the problem. Unrelated, uh, maybe new that we are looking. We are well, considering is RDMA flash extension a transport layer. I don't know how that work will pan out, but uh, we no, we will open we'll keep open uh, an open eye, mind. At the moment, the best um, the initial analysis is that it doesn't apply. What RDMA flash is used to do is if you do uh, an NF, if you were doing NFS write over RDMA, um, you issue an RDMA flush behind it to make sure the written data is stable before the write to, uh, the the, um, the NFS write completes. It turns out that for um, uh, for uh, NVMe fabrics, the RDMA uh, uh, control path runs the other way. And so when an NFS write is done, what happens is um, the storage destination of that write turns around and issues an RDMA read to go get the data. Uh, and as a result, uh, we don't need the flush command. Uh, in that case, and in reverse direction, there's no requirement for stable data on NFS clients. There's no point in sending in, in sending a flush uh, upward from the storage to, to the client uh, uh, for, for the read data. It's just put here to make sure we, we wrote, wrote it down so we don't, don't trip over this one again. And it's important because it's, it's a little different than what we know. As I mentioned before, you could in principle use uh, for RDMA push or pulls uh, this will make a differentiation between the two, I think. Right. In particular, and NVMRF is, is NVMRF uh, in particular, transport is spec that the storage is always in charge of the RDMA. Um, the RDMA is, the RDMA op is, ne is, is never originated by the, by, uh, by, by what any people call the host, which in this case is the PNFS client. Okay, moving on to status. Yes. Uh, thank you for, him. probably I'm uh, out of time. So. So uh, we have a working group milestone, uh, use NVMe in accessing the PNFS layout. Uh, the current date was supposed to be August, but uh, it took a little bit more work. First of all, there were some changes in the NVMe over fabric uh, versions uh, since we started, and uh, we wanted to uh, be sure that we reflect those. On the other hand, uh, we had some uh, thinking about, uh, you know, using the TCP because that's the preferred way that people are talking about in the industry. So uh, that's another thing that kind of we, we wrote something in the beginning and then we thought that maybe we should emphasize the PCP part. Uh, the initial drive will be submitted after sometimes after the meeting. As I said, it's not it's raw. It's not yet ready. But if uh, the group is interested, we will share. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll accept any uh, ideas and anything. Just if there are confusion, 
maybe that's the first step we'll be to discuss to prevent any confusion. I expect to ask that the subsequent draft version be adopted for uh, uh, what working group milestone is. We'll want to adjust date for that milestone uh, to August. Uh, uh, it's kind of early because we've made changes. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, we suggest end of the year or January 21, 2021. That's it. That's all I have. Uh, if you have questions, I don't have really much time. I see a question already. Wait, wait a second. Let me see if I can see the question as well. Yeah, escape. Okay. And then from can I see this? Okay, so let me I'm going to stop sharing, right? This is Chuck. I've got a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, okay. No, I okay. seem to recall there was a draft that Christoph wrote. What is the status of that? It's expired, I'm sure, but um is it not uh, appropriate to uh, re-advance that work? We're picking up, we're, we've picked up that draft from Christoph. We're gonna go uh, uh, bash, it, bash, bash, it, bash it into shape and submit it probably in a month or so. Chris, 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 Christoph's part and parcel of this effort. Yeah. Right, well, there's, a, there's a, an effort here to submit an OO. I would think that if you're resubmitting this one, it's not gonna be OO, it's gonna be something like a one or it's it's going to turn out to be an OO because um, we're changing we we're we're, we're, chain, we're 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 changing the primary author. Okay, and that's plus, the only reason for that. Uh, yeah, and also we we used a lot of uh, the that draft, right? I mean, it, we, we merged the draft, but uh, it's uh, we had to add uh, way too much. So, uh, and also you remember that Christoph was not interested. So. Uh, we, we actually, we collaborate with us, which is good. I'm very happy, but uh, we took over. So that's why we call it zero, zero. Uh, and uh, in fact, maybe uh, we'll, it doesn't make sense to call it zero three because zero one and two are expired for a long time. So I don't think that will be useful. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I agree. I'm glad to see that it's moving forward. Um, the, uh, there's relevance to the presentation I'm going to make later, obviously. I have it on my slide. I wanted to mention your, uh, as a... <laughs> we sort of obliquely referred to your flush primitive, Tom. We got, we got partway there. Yeah, that, that's great. No, it's fine. I, uh, <laughs> I, I support it. I think it is appropriate to retitle the document. I mean, if you were building on that document and intending to take it to its logical conclusion, then maybe keeping the name for now would make sense. But it sounds like you're adding some significant content, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, to broaden the discussion. So I think it's perfectly appropriate. I mean, we have the, the possibility of updating it. Let's just do the right thing. Why be tied to an old name? And in any case, I think I, it's good that to collaborate all together, me, including Christoph, because, you know, we, we have new ideas for the new stuff, but we still base on, on his uh, initial uh, thinking so you know it, it's i was so good. It, it, it really on ease when we were not sure that you want to contribute so thank you uh G, bp for helping there is a question in the chat room bruce asks if there is a working prototype um, probably not because no, you, you um that requires an implementation of NVMe reservations. We've got a little, little bit of chicken and egg problem there. Yeah. So uh, you understand the protocol was just finalized in June, right? Or in July. So uh, I don't, uh, I have plans, by the way. I have plans for, uh, to, to look at this, right? But uh, in plans in a sense that even I tried few things, but not at the level of the protocol yet. So. I think that uh, it will need some more work. I would prefer to uh, do something when we decide which path to go and uh, assume that if uh, the group is uh, uh, confident that's important, maybe when we become a working group item, then uh, I will probably uh, provide some uh, implementation. I, I have something already done because our product will be uh, in the over fabric. 
Okay, do we want to have any sense of a consensus about whether this is the right approach? I mean, it seems good to me. So I think you, that was the, the main ask on your last slide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would be more than happy. I think it's important, and I believe that if it's not important today, it will be important in two months. I can tell you many, many vendors starting to look in this direction. I, from my experience in spec, I know that. So, you know. So is, is the ask to make it an NFS V4 working group item? Or is it that it is, there is an NFSV4 work group milestone? Um, the future ask will be when you have a DAF 00 draft to look at, the ask will the ask will be to adopt it as a work group draft against that milestone. That's pretty much what we want. We want first of all well, the, that will take a little bit of time before after we have the actual document. Correct. So yeah, yeah, let's yeah, sure, just sure. get that submitted and then ask. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the plan. That's the plan. We didn't ask for now. Yeah, we just mentioned that that's the direction, but uh, until we don't come to a consensus, there's no point in. Uh, in the, the, the original plan was to have the draft submitted in time in time for this meeting. Uh, between my day job, my wife decided to have her her sec her, her second uh, knee replaced earlier this year, and the coronavirus um, that didn't quite work out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm gonna bring uh, the ball back to host right which is NFS. i don't know if the dave is you or who is it? i think it should probably be chuck i guess chuck, okay so let uh now i cannot now, now you have to uh, pass it to chuck and i'm going to drop at this point thanks very much everybody this is david black okay so actually i'll start um but i think the the sharing token should be passed to Lars. Let me do that. Okay. He's not presenter. Yeah, he's he's going to. Well, I'm not sure exactly what he's going to do, but we had <laughs> planned a, a a demo of uh, the uh, GitHub template for um, RFC drafts, um, and so I right I can say a few words of uh, introduction uh, about this, what we're going to demonstrate here. Um, probably the first thing that I remember uh, when I started to participate in this working group is Tom Haynes uh, using GitHub uh, to um, publish uh, the editor's copy of his drafts when he was working on this. And I kind of adopted Git and then uh, later GitHub and uh, for my own work. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was talking with Lars about this and he said, oh yeah, now we have this mechanism that allows you to submit um, drafts, uh, draft revisions uh, directly from GitHub. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And so I tried that out and I, I sort of got myself hooked up with this um, template and then I uh, attended the uh, quick working group meeting uh, sometime in 2019, probably ITF 105, and I saw exactly what they were doing with this, and it was a whole lot more than just managing uh, commits to uh, um, internet drafts. Um, and I, it looks like this is something that um, we would want to adopt to manage working group documents to help us track uh, consensus items and decisions and problems with the documents and comments. Um, so with that in mind, I will uh, pass the baton to Lars and let him get on with it. Sure, hey, can you guys see my browser window and stuff readable? Mm, it's okay. Yeah, I can make it a bit bigger maybe. How's that? Okay, so I should first mention that there's not really any um, sort of globally sanctioned way in which uh, working groups can use GitHub. Every group is sort of doing its own little thing and, and Quick is maybe more aggressive and far out there than others. Um, there was a GitHub working group, I don't know if it's just concluded or if it's still sort of in the last stretch that is trying to write up some you know text about what you could do there. So there, there's an RFC and I can try and find it and forward it. Well, there will be an RFC. There's an internet draft at the moment. Um, 
but yeah, so basically, um, quick, um, we basically copied a lot of what we're doing from the HTTP working group, which isn't surprising because that's the main workload that we're currently carrying. Um, so we have created an organization on GitHub um, to start off with, which is called, um, you know, Quick Working Group. And it has a web page um, that is also hosted on GitHub, which is a little bit more friendly for newcomers to consume uh, compared to the data tracker page. So there's not a lot on there at the moment other than the documents and, and how people can contribute and so on. But it looks a bit nicer compared to like the data tracker complicated thing with 10,000 buttons. Um, and under this quick organization, we have a variety of repositories. Um, so we have one called working group materials that we're using for um, keeping all of the stuff for the various meetings. So for each ITF, we make a folder. For each interim meeting, we make a folder and uh, we sort of store you know, the PDFs of the presentations, the agenda as markdown, the arrangements as markdown, minutes as markdown. Um, and that's sort of our main repository. And since we're required to use the data tracker for archival purposes, we're also putting everything on the data tracker, but our working copy is, is usually on GitHub. And sometimes we forget to put stuff on the data, curve, data tracker for years and nobody notices until somebody does. So that, that's basically how we're using you know, work group materials. And I think many other groups are doing this too. Um, and then we have a um, repository for each um, internet draft that we're working on as a working group. So we don't put anything in here that isn't a working group adopted. That was a decision. Some other working groups uh, allow individual drafts to already move themselves under the working group organization. But we basically say once we have consensus for adoption, that's when something moves. And since GitHub lets you move uh, repositories now between organizations or from an individual account to an organization, you don't necessarily lose the history. You can actually move the existing repository that somebody like you know Chuck maybe already has under a hypothetical NFS working group GitHub organization. Um, we have a little bit of a wrinkle in that we have a bunch of drafts that are very heavily related and we're calling them the base drafts and, and there's a few of those and they live in one repository um, because when we started, GitHub didn't let you move issues between repositories and the base drafts. We often found ourselves wanting to move an issue that somebody had opened against one document to another document because it actually, you know, the text moved or something like that. Um, these days, you would probably really make that different, but but we we didn't. Um, so there's a README, and and this is basically Martin Thompson's ID template that uh, Chuck has mentioned that lets you um, write uh, documents in Markdown and uh, with a sort of continuous integration back and automatically submit the XML to the IETF. And Martin's template generates this nice readme thing that has clickable links that generate you know, diffs to the, what's called the editor's copy, which is a snapshot of the current GitHub version against the last ITF draft and so on. And we're using it quite heavily. Um, right, so that, that's basically how we're organizing our materials. This is not, not, nothing sort of earth, earth shattering. Um, we have um, some teams here for people. So it, it, uh, we have this group called, um, what is it called? Well, we have the chairs, right? Uh, which is the three of us that have, you know, full access to everything. Um, we have a group uh, of, uh, we have a team for each of the editors of the different um, drafts. So the base drafts, they have a group called base editors uh, who have right access to that repository. Uh, for the other drafts, we have datagram editors and so on. Um, and then on the bottom here, you can see a team called uh, ZH Chinese Translators. Um, these are a bunch of Chinese people that are translating our drafts into Chinese, and they have their own repository with their work, so they have a team too. Um, this is mostly so that we can do access control so that you know um, only editors have actually write access. Um, we have um, a, a team called Contributors, which is sort of pretty big as 30 members. Um, this is sort of basically everybody who wants to be there uh, gets gets added to that. And that's because um, in GitHub, you can only assign issues to people who are somehow in a team that's associated with the organization. And so if you want to give somebody who isn't an editor 
uh, the ticket to work on an issue, uh, that person needs to be part of some team and that team here is contributors. So that's uh, been growing over, over time and we just add people there as needed. And also if you want to have somebody else review something, right, you can do a code review and so on, which we do on the spec and you can also assign them there. So that's what we have the teams for. Um, right, something that we're using very heavily is um, um, issues. Um, so, and, and this is a quite a busy, so this is the base draft, it was our main specs. You see we had 5,800 something commits uh, since we started with 70 contributors. We had 139 releases. So there's quite a bit of activity. There's, at the moment, 25 branches. Um, we have a bunch of open issues. Um, and um, you see that, that those are also, we have 3,600 uh, issues that, that were you know worked on during specifying quick. And we have a, so we have a bunch of labels that we found useful. And, and again, this is up to each working group to define what, what they find useful. We have labels for um, you know, which draft in the space draft repository is this issue related to? You know, is it the HTTP draft, the invariance draft, you know, recovery, and so on? Um, and then we have uh, labels that have a different diff different colors that we sort of use. One is like, is this a editorial issue against the draft, meaning um, this is like a wording change or something that that doesn't touch uh, standards level text. Um, we have decided as the quick working group that we let the editors of our documents just deal with those without doing consensus calls. So the chairs label the issues. And if, if we decide that an issue is editorial, we label it as such, and then the editors go and take those and assign it to whoever wants to work on it, and they fix it. Um, conversely, if something's labeled design, it actually changes the uh, current, the, you know, the current consensus on, on operation of the protocol. So somebody wants to like add a must or you know add a new protocol mechanism or something. Those issues get labeled design and those actually get then last called in the working group and progress through a pipeline. Um, and these other labels down here has consensus and valid needs discussion parked and so on. Those are actually what, some that, that we use for um, keeping track of where stuff is in this in this consensus pipeline. Um, pull requests is, so issues, we have a pretty distinct um, uh, rule that, uh, so issues change are basically diffs against against the, the spec, but we don't uh, allow discussions on issues, we, uh, on, on pull requests. We want the discussions to happen on the issue that's associated with the pull request. This is again, just by convention so that you don't have to like always remember whether something was discussed in, in the issue or the, or the pull request. Um, and what we use pretty heavily is this project board. Um, and, and you can have many project boards. Quick has one, it's pretty big though, uh, which is called late stage processing, which is where we're in. And um, this is sort of automated. So, so GitHub lets you uh, automate sort of a workflow here um, on the bottom here. You can see that it says automated as to do. So when somebody opens a new issue, uh, we basically put it in triage where it, it lives in this column here um, and the chairs monitor the discussion on the issue. Um, and to, in order to decide whether it's editorial or design. And if, when something is editorially designed, we label it and then the automation then puts it into either this editorial issues column where everything is green editorial or the design issues column where everything is blue and has a design label. So that's automated. And as I said, the editorial ones that the editors pick up fix it, and when it gets resolved, it goes all the way over here to uh, issue handled. And then you can see that there's a bunch of editorial and design ones. The design issues, um, we um, leave in this column, they get worked on, um, the working group you know, discusses them. Um, and when, again, the chairs and, and the editors of the respective document that the issue is filed against feel that you know, um, consensus is emerging. Uh, we label something as proposal ready, which would move it from this column to this column. Once they've been sitting here for a while, um, we then email the list and say, hey, um, these issues have seem to have gotten consensus on GitHub. We want to confirm that on the list. And we start like a working group last call on an issue and say, if you object to the proposed resolution, uh, you know, you have two weeks or something. And this then then issues end in this column called consensus call issued, which is this nice pink. And um, once that period has expired, we basically say consensus declared. 
label it, and then the editors can merge the resolution to the issues into the documents, and the issues finally go over here. So this is, um, you know, it, you need to run through this a couple of times before it makes sense in your head. But it's been very helpful for you know us to have this because, as I said, we have thirty six six hundred issues. We could not have done this uh, by email or something like that, or uh, in any other way that that we could easily think of. And and since everybody is sort of familiar with GitHub these days, it also lets other people um, work on this pretty easily and get up to speed. Um, there's a few other little things that we've done. We have um, obviously we have a, the the quick working group mailing list, but we've also created. Um, so we had some pretty strong pushback that people said, you know, we don't want to join. I don't want to join GitHub to work on the spec. I want to work by email, and and that's fine. Um, I would still encourage people to get familiar with this. You know, it might be helpful to have this on your CV. But uh, um, for the people who absolutely want to use email, we basically created um, a, another mailing list called uh, Quick Issues. And that um, is uh, subscribed to all the repositories of the, of the Quick Working Group organization. So that mailing list is subscribed. And so every time somebody comments on an issue or does anything, an email gets automatically generated by GitHub that goes to that mailing list. And, and so do you get hundreds or maybe sometimes a thousand emails a day to that mailing list. But if people want to subscribe to that torrent of information, they can then reply by email and it you know, ends up in the GitHub server and GitHub extracts the stuff and puts it into the ticket and everybody else just sees it on the web. So it is possible to work on this uh, or follow the quick uh, working group if you don't want to be going to get up. doing that is at least two uh, or three are. Um, okay. <laughs> so nobody who's no, nobody's actually implementing quick or um, none of the sort of core contributors, but we have a bunch of people who are sort of our congestion control people, for example, that are just interested in making sure that the quick congestion control works, and they seem to like email better than um, okay. GitHub. So yeah, so that, that's sort of all I can really remember uh, in terms of what we're doing. There might be some more things that I'm forgetting now, but those are the, the, the highlights. So it's been very helpful. Uh, I will certainly do this for any other working group that I end up sharing in the future. Um, but it does require you know, really strong buy-in from, uh, from the community. And for Quick, it was easy to have that because we started from scratch. And also our you know, engineers, are, I would say, at least in transport, if not in the IITF, they're probably among the youngest participants that we currently have, right? Everybody's like in their 20s or maybe early 30s. And so for them, this is oftentimes the first time they do an ITF group. And so uh, doing it this way was not any different for them than anything else. Um, and it really let us sort of keep track of stuff and move pretty quickly, which was nice. All right, I think I spoke for too long. I don't know how much time I had, but we can do questions or you can send me email or as you wish. I think at one point, Dave Novak had some concerns about uh, IETF legality around this, um, you know, putting this kind of stuff into a public um, Git repository before it's actually submitted. Uh, Dave, did I'm you worried to get, about getting getting pushed back because of the, the, these dead periods, which I don't like, but I, I'm sure we'll get some pushback on things like that. There, I mean, there. Um, there's no difference to. Right? So, as as a working group, right, once something is adopted, you can work on it in this in this form. But even private drafts get worked on GitHub. So I don't. There's no legality that's really a problem here. We have. Um, I don't know where we have it. It's certainly. I think it's on the, on the main the main page here. So basically, we have um, contribution guidelines up here. Um, that are, you know, again, GitHub wants you to have these anyway for your repositories. And it says about, you know, do you need to follow and has some pointers to the ITF list and rules and yeah. this is some so boilerplate like text. I think the main point here is really that uh, anything you submit into the Git repository or the Git uh, is considered uh, ITF contributions. It's up on the participants to, at the same way as you submit the draft, if you submit a pull request for a text change, you are promising that the, all the copyright rules, all the other things that apply to the text also applies for this uh, pull request, for example. 
So, or the yeah. same as you would send an email to the mailing list, it's a contribution to the ITF. This is applied in the same way. Yeah. Um, one thing I should also mention, which which isn't uh, GitHub, but it, it goes hand in hand with it, is that we have a very active Slack. Uh, it started out as a as a Slack channel for the different teams and the different companies and organizations that are implementing Quick. So we're mostly focused on interop, but it turns out you can't really separate interoperation from specification, um, as you guys probably know better than we did when we started this. And so there's in the beginning we said the Slack channel is you know not under the IETF node well, and that became quickly impractical because people just started discussing, oh, we need to change this in the draft because the interop is failing here. And so we decided that the Slack channel is also under ITF node well. And at the moment, we have like 233 people uh, subscribed to that Slack channel. So it's pretty big. And since we're using the free instance where you only get 10,000 messages, 10,000 messages on that Slack is basically six weeks. So it's very, very active. And there's 20 or 30 different channels. Um, and, and most of the discussion, if it's not on GitHub, it's in the Slack. And the mailing list for Quick is surprisingly quiet given the amount of work that's happening. And, and the Slack is sort of open. We, you know, any everybody who emails the chairs can can you know join. And if you're in there, you can also invite others. So it's not like locked down for to chair approval, but um, that that's been a very good resource as well because it makes collaboration much easier. And specifically for these 20, 30 year old engineers that don't really understand email, Slack they do understand. So if, I mean, if you guys are thinking about using GitHub for, for NFS, right, I would sort of maybe start slow and, and move the documents there and try and then uh, maybe for a new document uh, that you're starting from scratch, uh, try to you know work with GitHub issues instead of email issues and, and try it out sort of maybe with, with one document or so and see how it works for you. And then if it works well, migrate more uh, of your work over. I would suggest a small document first, maybe. <laughs> so I, I've been doing that with my personal documents. Um, and uh, you've shown us an enormous amount of process here, which we probably won't need because we're a much smaller uh, working group. Um, but it seems like uh, managing our working group documents in a common Git repository might be useful. Um, I know that we're looking at tackling a very large effort with uh, um, renovating RFC 5661, which is almost 700 pages. Um, so this might be helpful there. Um, that's that's my commendation. Okay, so, uh, okay, let me think about that and, uh, and want to make my plans to do that. I'll, I'll consider that and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, using it for that document, okay? Yeah, and, and to be clear, I mean, you don't, I mean, if, if people are very used to XML rather than Markdown, uh, there's no, I mean, you could stay with XML. I don't know how well the kind of submission part of this works, but it's all the building tools, et cetera, for the Git, et cetera, works fine, with, even with XML, so. It certainly does. That's, I've stuck with XML, and I haven't, I haven't switched to Markdown. Uh, all my documents are XML source. Markdown has the one advantage that it's it's a bit nicer looking in on on the web because Git has some magic that can make Markdown you know diffs look look okay. I don't know how well that works for XML and and it's sort of easier to do copy and paste with with Markdown compared to XML formatted text. But you certainly can do it with XML. Experience. I had a little project and uh, I had to scratch my head uh, with XML. I mean, if you look at the the markdown of a, of the documents here, right? They sort of you can you can basically read even the raw markdown pretty easily, which is not necessarily the case with the raw XML. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. That isn't true. The raw XML is really easy to read. All right, I'm not going to get into the debate. I did a 700 page document with it. It's easy. <laughs> Maybe after 700 pages, it becomes easy. 
Well, uh, one big issue is that the uh, big project we were talking about taking on is a revision of, like you say, a 700-ish page document that is already in XML. So I don't know that anybody wants to take over figuring out how to uh, reformat it all in there. Uh, something else. Scripts. So, so some people have have done exactly that. So they have, there's some automation available. I don't know if it's fully automated, but what they have done is basically they the, you you submit a zero zero of your BIS document that is just the XML to Markdown conversion. So there's no other changes, and then you take that as the baseline and then move forward. But again, this is up for you guys to decide. I'm not touching that document. I'm not qualified to write NFS specs. Okay, well, maybe that's the way to do it. Take it off time. We need to think about possibly uh, how we'd uh, handle changes. I mean, uh, another thing we might want to do uh, is uh, take uh, uh, work through the uh, changes that we have in Git logs of the existing document, of uh, other documents to uh, bring them into this document. I don't know if that would make that uh, more difficult. So I think we're about 15 minutes behind now, so we'd probably best move on to the next yeah, topic. We should move on. I think that's you. Yep. Do I have the ball? Yeah. Oh, let's see. Let's see how we do that. Okay. Uh... I gave you the ball. Okay. Hey, uh, everybody. This is Brian. Um, yeah, Etherpad is acting funny. People are typing things, and the list of attendees text just appeared within the notes in minutes. So, um, not sure why, Magnus. <laughs> okay, this is a directory performance scalability. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, and in fact, I don't think there's much here to present other than just a problem statement. Um, so I'm sure uh, all of all of us as NFS practitioners have received anecdotes from uh, users uh, and administrators over the years about the problems uh, with managing uh, applications that want to use um, directories as just a flat namespace. Um, that's quite problematic. It's problematic for POSIX file systems in general, but especially so for NFS for a variety of reasons. Um, we also have this problem where uh, the server can vary the, the, the uh, set of entries in a directory based on uh, the permissions that the requesting user has. Um, I don't know if that's a problem in today's implementation, but I, I'm told that's that's going to be an issue eventually. I guess SMB does this. Um, I'm not sure. Not an expert there. Yes, SMB does. It's called access based enumeration. A B E. Yeah. Right. So I think this would be a problem for uh, multi protocol NFS servers um, that that allow access to a directory both via SMB and via NFS. Um, and a third problem is uh, the age old untar problem, where untar seems to proceed uh, very serially through its through its uh, tar file. Uh, and it creates these uh, it creates directories and files one at a time and and it's uh, completely synchronous with uh, the server's backend storage. And that's increasingly a problem for um, these uh, data center area file systems where you've got um, m multiple copies of every block uh, behind an NFS server target. Um, and there's a, a you know there's a replication protocol that's going on back there that makes that makes these things very slow um, so they they don't they are not very fast with uh, individual uh, creation operations but if you send them a bunch of operations in parallel then they seem to do pretty well they will scale um, and untar just sort of flies in the face of, of that whole paradigm so I think we need to We've been telling people we we've been telling people you know if you want untar to go fast uh, you have to write a special version that that parallelizes the untar process and 
you know, some people are, are, are taking up that challenge and some folks are like, no, Antar has to work fast. Um, so I, I kind of boiled down a, a set of scalability goals um, to, to help us focus the conversation a little bit. Um, we, you know, we're really dealing with a lot of legacy applications, um, uh, especially some we found that interleave uh, um, uh, get dense uh, read dir operations and directory modification like uh, um, creations and deletions. Um, that's that's a real problem for NFS just because of the way uh, most NFS clients cache directories. Um, now we have our usual um, bag of tricks here for making things faster. Um, you know, make this make this server faster, the durable storage on the server faster. Um, use more aggressive caching on the client. Um, make things parallel, like I was mentioning before with Untar. You can Untar things uh, in parallel rather than sequentially. Um, make the transport faster to get uh, the data back and forth between the client and the server faster. Uh, and then, of course, the one that, that we've been um, playing with most recently is server offload, where we've got copy and clone operations. Um, but somehow these tricks don't seem to apply directly to the directory conundrums that we're facing. Um, so, you know, I've tried to write down some solutions here. Maybe people have other ideas or think my problem statement is is way off. Uh, so I'm I'm open to hearing uh, comments at this point. Okay. You mentioned direct write delegation. So we don't have that, but we do have directory read delegation and notifications. Have you looked at that? And first of all, I'm wondering why that hasn't been implemented. And second of all, I know whether it might help. Would a directory read delegation to, would a directory read delegation help delegation. for for Antar? No, it wouldn't. Yeah, I mean that's that's a I pretty common workload. Would. Certainly yeah. wouldn't inval I think uh, my hope would be that that by using notifications you could avoid continuing to uh, destroy the cache. I don't I haven't looked at that, but well, it's not a problem of so my, uh, that's you know, question, other. How 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 helpful directory redelegation here? So let's take let's take the multi-client cases out of this uh, consideration and think about only the single client. Um, the single client is going to, when it creates a file in a large directory, is going to create that file and then it's going to invalidate its its uh, directory cache for that directory. So it doesn't have to. It doesn't. Why not? I mean, the server is completely in control of the of the cookies. It has to read all of those cookies back from the server because any one of them or all of them could have changed. Well, there is a provision in, in for notification where you're notified of change, and the assumption is that is probably enough, or it might be enough. And maybe we need to. Uh, well, it may not a valid assumption to say everybody can change every cookie on every operation. I mean, that's a a, a way toward 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 for dealing with that. Well, the fifth bullet down is sort of in that area. It. Uh, but it takes a different approach. It, it would be uh, where the client asks a server for a range of cookies that it can use. Um, and then it is free to do creation operations without contacting the server again until it's ready to to find out what the, the creation uh, M time and C time is of, of each individual file, although that's not in directory entries. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the client, you know, being able to, I guess we could think of this as a reverse uh, server offload where we are asking the server for a set of resources that the client can use at its own whim. Uh, and then when the client is done, it can write them all back and and could get back the unused ones. Um, and, and it can tell the server, oh, I, I actually use these for these, for these files. And it could be entirely uh, asynchronous with applications. It's a little sort of like getting a layout on a directory, being able to write the directory yourself, right? Yeah. No, but okay. 
No, it's like in a delegation on directory. It's not like in a, Well, a delegation, okay, sir. I don't know about layoff. Okay, I, I have a different approach to that. But anyway, yeah. all right, all right. You can go on. Sorry about that. All right, well, the only, the, you know, the wrap up here is that I don't have a document here. I'm just, I would, I, I'm not sure how to approach the problem, and I don't think we have any good solutions here. Um, but I would like further brainstorming. It, uh, I'm not sure how to go about doing that. I guess I guess it's up to us implementers to come up with some idea, and then and then see if people think that it's it's going to be able to apply um, uh, without without issues on other uh, for other. Uh, implementations. I mean, the implementation of file system directories is, is pretty complex and it's different in each file system, physical file system. So yeah, I'm not sure what to do there. Anyway, uh, we can wrap this up right now and uh, move on to the next one. Thank you. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Etherpad is acting crazy. I'm taking the minutes offline now. Magnus suggested that. I can't even get back into Etherpad. If you're working on it, keep adding stuff to it, but I'll be working offline on minutes. So I have to share something, but I, it seems to have been event. Okay. okay. Let's see. All right. Let me see how to share. Uh, Chuck, are you still have to hold this? So you have to give this, give this permission back to me. I think as the host, you can take it from me. Okay, all right. Change role to presenter. Okay, all right. All right, sure. Um, okay, uh, this is a, pr a proposal or pre-proposal or something about perhaps improving the parallel parallelism of director uh, operations. It's not, well, there are small points of contact with what Chuck, I'm not looking at anything like untar, I'm just looking at general pr performance. I'm looking at situations where you, where you have servers that are processing a lot of work in parallel, in parallel, and maybe maybe directory layouts is one way to do that. So uh, in the past, we've had a lot of discussion of directory layouts with striping, and it never, didn't seem to go anywhere. And I think the reason, probably, I'll talk a little bit later about why it didn't go anywhere. But I will also talk about why this might be so, uh, follow up on, even though that is not as as uh, 
ultimately perform it. On the other hand, it's simpler, easier to implement, and I think my, it might be worth, I'm presenting it because I think it might be worth people following up on as one way to improve directory performance, so not for the specific items that uh, I've talk, talked about. So the basic idea is you have a PNFS-like directory layout. And this is directed in my case, my service implementation case, in the case of, to the case of uh, cases where we have a clustered server and uh, you naturally put different directories on different servers and you get a lot more parallelism if you simply allowed the client to get a, a layout saying, hey, if you want to do something to this directory, go here without striping them. That provides greater handle, handling in the parallelism. It's inter, in, it's inter directory parallelism within the same file system rather than the intra directory parallelism as in the, uh, in the striping case. Now, I say PNFS like because there's some differences in common, as well as commonalities. The common out is the primary responsible for a function is given to another server, the layout bestower, who's in the in normal PNFS is the role of the metadata server. He can, he can perform the function if requested, but typically clients will go to the guy who holds the layout. There's no striping. That's mainly because I couldn't see how to do striping, and I've seen what problems were. It seemed to be never ended, and we never, the attempts to do this with striping didn't work out too well. But you at least have read and write layouts. And you have a single, unlike the case of PNFS for data, we would only have a single layout type rather than multiple ones. All right. So uh, why I think this is worth explaining. First of all, it's a relatively easy way of improving directory power parallelism. I put the, uh, it's quite easy. I think you need to provide great performance, parallelism and handling of director operators. My focus is on build environments rather than the cases. Now, I one area of contact that Chuck and I both mentioned is remove, re, remove R. That's some interest, and I think maybe the best way to do that is the, is the way that Chuck is sort of offload. Treat this as an as an operation that you uh, give to the, uh, the server as a whole and let him tell you when he's done. Uh, I'm assuming enough jobs to avoid the need, need to parallelize sing, single commands. So that's no different from my approach, my talk and Chuck's. Now, many attempts to to do to do striping have have not resulted in improved because the support directory strip they've not worked out. Uh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. It, that was based on my, post, I just saw lots of messages on the system that tuned it out and somehow they all, the, the process all died. And it was my, what I'm assuming is that uh, it's probably not, if someone is interested in resurrecting that, we could resurrect, but I'm not. And the other issue is, when well, we have delegations and notifications in RFC 5661, but they're not, imp not implemented, and I'm not I'm not sure why. And I think I'm, I'm not asking if someone knows and can uh, speak up. I'm also in, in asking for discussion of this on the list. If we have this feature, is it because it was wrong with spec, wrong thought out, not the right thing? If so, can we improve it? Can we work to implement it? I don't know. I think we should be looking at that as that's a, a big piece of RFC 5661 and I don't know why it wasn't implemented. All right. Now, we have had many people, as I said, in work on striping of, 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 uh, of directories. But the problem is, it's hard to strike because there's no obvious correlate for, for file offsets. 
There are hashes you might use, but it's hard to get agreement on the client, the server, the on-disk FS. And I saw this discussed endlessly and just figured maybe it's not worth it. And it is that, that kind of thing is necessary for performance of extremely large directories, but how common these are. They're more common uh, than I think, but it's also a question of how common they should be. And maybe this is, that's just the wrong thing. And maybe we, there's no, no real percentage in trying to make those perform well. But this is a good way to provide within directory parallelism. That's better than only provide uh, striping is a good way to provide within directory parallelism. It's better than only provide inter inter directory parallelism. But so far we don't have it. There's no expectation we will have it, and maybe we should just move on. Now, possible alternatives to this is, well, directory delegations. And Chuck has men, mentioned directed write delegations. Uh, but, and I think, it, I think much of what he's talked about makes sense, but my sense of how things work is that if we don't, can't get people to invest the effort in directory read delegations, it's hard to believe that, uh, we get the uh, people to invest in directory write delegations. Needs there so much more complicated. So why weren't directory delegates? Yes. Question. Anyway, uh, the delegations of 56s were never implemented, and we need to understand why. It might be simple inertia. If it's that maybe just people should start thinking about it. Uh, I know a number of people have mentioned to me, gee, we implemented file delegations and that was not a big improvement. And that may have a role. We need to understand if the expectations for directory delegations are better. And, or is there a problem with directory delegation that we can address? Now, Chuck and, our, and I, in our discussion, talked about, gee, the idea that, well, you've changed this one file and then potentially every, cookie for every file might change. That might be a simple thing that we could address. With an attribute bit saying, okay, the client may tell you, okay, yes, I'll give you notifications, but I will agree that I will not change his cookies of existing files without that. If that's worth doing, we should think about that. So, are there, uh, Chuck has tried to start, start discussion process. And I think maybe we should have a discussion process, which is focused on director performance, not only on the cases he's talked about, but what we can do in general to, uh, to improve performance if this is an area, if this is an area of, of, uh, of interest for everybody. So Dave, I, this is Tom Haynes. Um, I don't know Hello. that I agree necessarily that file Delegations are not performant. That's not what we have seen. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, that's what people tell me. I, I haven't. Uh, I think. I think maybe it's not a question of them not being performant, but there are a lot of environment where they're not 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 all that useful. I think that's what I'm hearing, but I I I I I don't speak of that as direct knowledge, but. Okay. So anyway, if, if we decide this is worth it, there's some protocol details to work out, and I don't think there'd be that much trouble to work out. Basically, I think there's a lot of text here, but the basic thing is you define this mark, this, this, this layout type. It works, you, you get a layout. And I think because of the, rule, the way the rules for work, you, you get your own format for the layout get request and the layout return, because uh, I think that's provided for by the, the way that we, we, we just define for every layout tie, he gets his 
own version of that previously opaque structure. And I think you would, you would not have striping for this. You'd have layout levels for read and write and may need also separate bits for the write of the, the owner of the directory to, to work, to, to respond not only to look, to, to uh, re remove, rename, uh, look up, but also to open. And that would be one way of spreading out the metadata load. In some so, cases. so this sounds like you're, you're pushing the two issues together. You described a use case where you want to have basically um, this directory is located on this cluster server or that cluster server. That has nothing to do with the, your delegations that you're describing. Why do you need read write in the case of the describing delegation because it's trying layout? Why do you need read or write layouts based on location? No, you don't. You probably don't. But I think you always have the well, you do have the ability to copy the thing and give everybody a read layout or decide you that it's on location, give everybody a write layout. So you don't need it, but it's 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 a natural part of defining it. I just don't know what it means to be different. Do you? Okay, so you might say the read layout. You can go to cluster B. And it'll be slower to access if you want writes, but and it just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, I, I, you know you might. It sounds like you're trying to force it into. The layout definition, because part of it matches, and I don't know. The, the other thing that's problematic to me is when you you have a file layout, you only have one layout type per file system, and now you're saying, well, I'm going to have a file layout and a directory layout per system, or are you saying there's only one layout type per system? It's still no, I think you point out something that would have to be addressed. Yes. So there's now an as a layout type uh, uh, attribute, and there you would need both uh, a, a layout type attribute and a directory layout type attribute. You wouldn't have to rename layout type uh, as file layout type, but that's the essence of what you're saying. It is, it is correct. And if you do that, you may address the issue of I don't need read or write. I don't know. Yes. Okay. So I'm looking to assess working group interest. And I'm not hearing a lot of interest, but I am having an interest in the general, seeing here and in the general problem. And I think we have to figure out how we can discuss this on the list. And so I think, I think. Uh, Chuck has brought up some interesting issues. I think we should should have a general discussion of that and see what what the interest is. And I think, oh, I wouldn't make the case the strong case for this. I would make a strong case for understanding why directory delegations aren't implemented and and making them part of the solution if if it if it's possible. That's it for me. Okay, who's next? I think it's Tom. Just a second, I'm gonna check. No, it's Soren. That's me. I need the ball. Question attributes. Oh right, it's all right, Soren first. Okay, yes. Okay, I'll have to I'll I'll I'll, I'll have to just deal with that. Okay. Can you pass the ball, please? Soren, it looks like anybody can drag okay, the let's ball. Figure this out. I'm I'm allowed to drag the ball here. Let me try it. I give, I try to give you the ball. It tells me I can do it, but then it doesn't do it. I know. Same for me. <laughs> oh, it does. Okay. I tried to move it, and I can move it, but it doesn't stay. It goes back to whatever it was. Gee, that is a great user interface, okay, WebEx. 
I tried last time, so that's why I, I know <laughs> I'm an expert. So, Dave, uh, David, can you please uh, move the ball for me? If I can figure out how to do this, okay, persistent. All right, let's see, this is Soren. It won't let me do it. No, we want to do this from from this this window. Let me find the other one. Okay. I trust your knowledge of WebEx. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this one's. Soren, are there slides for this? Yes, I, I will. I'll, I'll, okay, change I'll, role to presenter. Soren? Yeah. Send them later. I'll send you after it. Okay. There we go. Okay, so now I need to find the right thing and. Okay, can everybody see? Do I have to wait a little bit or? Nothing yet. Again. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about this. Good. So this is a continuation of uh, the first uh, draft work that I had. That I had um, in Montreal. I tried to uh, take into account all the considerations from the meeting and uh, this draft is uh, my try to fulfill all that. So first of all, I know I won't waste too much time on the importance or use of this, uh, but it is clear that it's related to the new media, very expensive, and uh, generally uh, the amount of data is exploding, while as the you know the media doesn't keep up. So the only best way to do keep up is to uh, reduce the data as much as possible, or the the minimum. That we're talking when we're talking even exabyte is okay, but already people are talking uh, two order of magnitude about that. So that I think it will become de facto every storage system will have to do the best to reduce the data. Also, uh, the memory of servers increases because they currently can use NVMe devices, as we discussed before. And uh, also, there are new faster NVA fabric interconnect uh, available as well. So that's that's the where we stand today. And that's why it's important to try to reduce the data as much as possible before uh, pushing to to backend. So how do you address this problem? Uh, there are new data reduction methodology algorithms and uh, compression uh, enhancement to improve data reduction. Uh, there are uh, new methodologies using variable blocks uh, and fixed blocks because the variable blocks give you an opportunity to compress better depending on compressibility of the data. Uh, there is also a lot of uh, work in the compression hardware. For example, using Microsoft ZipLine or Intel creating chips or any other FPGA. Many vendors already use this uh, accelerator. The data reduction for the data reduction. The data reduction require a larger memory and larger number of cores. And uh, of course, we're looking at the world right now. The number of cores explode. The number of new servers has both a lot of memory. It's not uncommon to have uh, terabytes of memory, uh, RAM memory, right? And hundreds of cores. What's missing is uh, user information related to data reduction that arrays cannot know. So what we are trying to do with this draft is to offer a way to transmit the data reduction attributes or characteristics from the NFS uh, clients to NFS server. 
Current TNF phase four has no means to communicate data reduction attributes. So uh, um, our initial thinking was to use uh, extended attributes, and uh, it seems that it was not uh, accepted and it was not uh, recommended by the working group. So uh, we are looking for different uh, ways, other ways to use attributes. So NFS server data reduction engine operates the file system block, typically 8K streaming Linux, but could be other uh, uh, blocks. There is analytics, uh, anal analysts data regarding compression of different types of files that can be in, can improve data reduction engines in the array efficiency, meaning that you can, uh, you know, even if there is unknown uh, the compression uh, ratio, it's known what type of compression is used, and that's useful. There is no way to take advantage of this data, as the application DR characteristics are not visible to the DR engine, right? So we need a way to uh, communicate this uh, information. There is a new draft extending the PNFS CASI to NVMe that I presented before, and we, we propose to use uh, uh, name attributes in, in the same context. We propose to expand data reduction to apply to PNFS cards. What we need from NFS before, um, and by the way, if there are questions, I'm sorry, I, I am full skin, I cannot see the questions, so I, I could address them uh, at the end. We need a way to communicate the data reduction characteristics from client to server. We propose to add few uh, optional attributes, data compression and dedupe. We don't propose any implementation solutions for DR. We just use a mechanism to transfer the knowledge. We just allow better data reduction when the data reduction engine has additional information about the target. And if it do doesn't, there, there are uh, arrays that do as you know best effort, but uh, in many cases, if the data is specific characteristic, like genomics, for example, it's not trivial. You cannot precisely uh, say this unless there is a pure information. File extensions, uh, we assume that file extensions can indicate file type. Uh, file headers can uh, indicate compression type also. And uh, we prevent applying data reduction on uncompressible data using the attribute. So if uh, data is not compressible, uh, it's a uh, performance enhancement not to try. So I give you two, two use cases. The, the first use case is uh, a normal NFS server, uh, which uh, talks to a reduction engine, which generally it's uh, inside the, the storage uh, segment, right? To the block storage. Uh, the assumptions for use case is the NFS server can communicate with so many attributes as metadata directly to the reduction engine, meaning that the client will transfer the uh, attributes to the server, and the server will be in have a protocol to connect and transfer this information to the block storage. Uh, backend identifies files and blocks of a file and can associate to each block. So if there is information at the file level about how compressible a certain file is, that can also be associated uh, to uh, for each of the blocks that belong to the same file. In this uh, discussion between NFS server. Uh, the other case is uh, PNFS over NVMe SCSI. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see that the client can talk, the server can uh, talk to the engine, but it's also possible that using the NVMe uh, channels and SCSI channels to transmit that information directly from the client to the uh, reduction engine. The data reduction name attributes are accessed by uh, open operation using hidden directory of attributes associated. Uh, NFS server extracts the data reduction recommended attributes and pass their down to the block store. This is some example that is not, not new. That's what I gave the example before. It will be, it is part of the draft. So uh, we decided to use uh, new uh, recommended attributes that. Uh, Recommended attributes are stored with the file system object, should be preserved when files and directories are updated, moved, or copied. 
Attributes are hints for the client application regarding file compression and duplication. Uh, these attributes are intended for data needed by applications rather than by an NFS client implementation. So it's kind of a communication from the application directly to the backend. NFS implementers are strongly encouraged to define the new data reduction attributes as recommended attributes, not mandatory. So, uh, and then a client should check if these attributes exist or not. The attributes are hidden in metadata and should be retrieved by the NFS server and passed down to the engine. So that's outside of the scope of this. Uh, protocol enhancement that we are looking at, uh, we propose enhancements to NFS protocol operations to allow recommend attributes to be queried and modified by clients. Add new attribute uh, bitmap for to allow uh, uh, data reduction recommended attribute support. Uh, recommend, at, recommend attributes may be examined and changed by normal get up or set up operation. I think this was a conclusion from last time and I think it was uh, it's positive. Uh, and return by open command. And attributes can be modified by users uh, by users and stored with the file system object, both files and directory. So uh, again, uh, what we'll ask this time, uh, would not, I would like to uh, the opinion of the group about adding such data reduction attributes uh, to the NFS before protocol as named attributes or any other you know, that would be in the current uh, intention. Uh, should this become working group item? Should we first define the protocol changes to support DR before adoption? Is the working group interested in data reduction, data reduction attributes as defined in this draft? We want to ask for the working group review of the data. Now, what I just want to mention, that there is interest. But uh, I, uh, you know, as you know, I'm in the spec committee and there's a Interest, interest in that space for the spec for uh, this type of data reduction attribute. So it, uh, I don't have many, many customers to uh, know that that's correct, but there are some of our customers that are asking questions regarding that. So, our, uh, so thank you very much. And I upload the slides when I'm done. Soren, are you going to take this to the working group uh, alias to follow up? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, please. Yeah. Sorry about. Okay, that. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, are these the attributes defined in this draft? Uh, not yet. Uh, it was just. Uh, I want to uh, to be sure that it's acceptable by the working group uh, to have such attributes. No, no, you can't. Doesn't work that way. You propose the things. And then you you don't you we're not going to say oh if you do this we're going to accept it no, 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 propose no, no, it no, no. and then the working group can consider it. I, I miss I miss I explained. I'm saying that I presented first time it was not accepted. I present again just a new idea. So if I can pursue it, if I should pursue it, of, of, of course the will have implementation and we, we, more more detail. Sorry, I. This well, I think the first time you, should pursue, you should define the attributes and then see with his interest. Okay. So, but the question is, what kind of attribute? That was the discussion last time. That's why I had to uh, present again. Understand? Because last time I used extended attributes and nobody accepted that. So now I I changed that. That that's the novel. There's a difference from the last time. So. I don't mind. To I think the working, working group on. agrees that these are normal, so-called recommended attributes, but you have to define what they are. I'm going to define. Uh, look, and until uh, that, anything regarding adopting adopting the thing, whether it's a working group item, all that stuff is all premature. I know. I know. I'm, I'm just asking. You know. So now I, I know you want to have more uh, more meat, and then uh, we'll we'll try. But you. I don't want more meetings. I want a document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying update the document. But what I meant is that I didn't want to waste time if nobody's interested in uh, in these types of attributes. That's my point. So that's what I why I tried. We, can, we don't know whether we're interested until we know what they are. Well, the question was useful then. But of course, we find the the right uh, definitions, but uh, it's a question of uh, 
does it work? Is it anybody interested in using Sorry, it? I think it's useful to raise awareness and, you know, we're certainly watching your presentation, but there's only a couple of handfuls of people here. The working yeah. group at large is, you know, needs to be engaged. Oh, yeah. And I agree with Dave, we need, we need something more concrete. Your, your ideas are interesting, but it, it's not up to the level of saying, yeah, we should proceed. At least I would like to uh, have some body review the draft. Good. Yeah. So I'm a little concerned about the first bullet on the last slide there. Um, why are you asking about named attributes? I'm not sure that the takeaway from the last presentation was that we rejected extended attributes. I think we said use regular fatter four style attributes. Don't use extended attributes for this. So. So I'm not sure why you're coming back and saying, well, should I use named attributes? I think we told you what would be acceptable for this. I don't see that you told the uh, not name attributes. Uh, I know about the extended attributes. So I just ask. I, I don't have an intention to use them, but I'm asking. No, I, I, I just don't. You know, I'm trying to save you some time. Uh, that's all. <laughs> that was. I'm not. I'm not criticizing or anything. I'm just a comment. Is I don't think that takeaway. You mentioned the takeaway about extended attributes. I'm not sure that is exactly what we were trying to communicate when we did last time. Oh, oh, uh, I thought that that was, uh, I don't know, that was my perception from the discussion that. Uh, well, we did say don't use extended attributes, but we did not say, but you should try named. We, I think we recommended specifically yeah, 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 yeah. use yeah. a fatter four attribute for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but uh, the point is that extended is not a, not accepted. Acceptable at all, right? That's what I I want. It's to... not, but neither would named attributes be. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm I'm asking. Do you prefer named attributes? I my intention is not to use named attributes, but that was uh... okay. I think we should move on. Yeah, so I'm done. Thank you. Right. I yeah. Have some slides. Back to you, Dave. Okay, sure. Let's move on to Tom. Who's next, I think? Okay. Now the presenter. Okay. Oh, somewhere up here. That showing for everybody yet? Yes, to me. All right, let's get started. Um, I have seven slides here. I'm going to try to move quickly. You have perhaps seen some of them. I forwarded these slides to the mailing list about half hour or 45 minutes ago, so you can see them there. Um, a brief introduction the flush extension is a proposed extension to the RDMAP and DDP protocols, collectively known as IWARP. Um, it supports three new operations, FLUSH, which is a placement guarantee for remote visibility and remote persistence, um, a little stronger, and uh, a two-way acknowledgement of, uh, of the state of data that you have previously written. Second, atomic write. It's a transactional 64-bit write and it's ordered to flush. Um, it's used, uh, uh, envisioned to be used primarily by things like log writers or replication, where you need to replicate the data, make the data secure and safe, and then uh, mark the data as present, like a log writer uh, pointer update. And third, a verify, which is a hash calculation of a remote region, uh, which can be used to verify the content. These three operations are present in a draft that I'll mention in a second. There's a similar effort underway in the InfiniBand Trade Association. This is the organization that owns InfiniBand and Rocky specifications. Uh, it's being published as an annex. The um, effort in the IBTA and the IWAR uh, uh, proposal that I published, uh, that we published the, uh, the draft, are they're compatible semantics. They're slightly different in that the IBTA extension does not currently include verify, 
but it's been discussed there. It was actually skipped in the interest of time. Uh, that decision is looking a little silly now that it's dragged out in, in a long period of time, but um, it's not off the table. It's just not current present. The Flush Extension ITF document is a document that I first published with a Microsoft co-author in February 2016, four years ago. It was called Draft Helpy RDMA Commit, and you can see its data tracker. It described at the time the fundamental requirements and concepts. It made it sort of a draft of a, of a protocol, but it didn't jump to that conclusion at that time. The idea was to lay out the requirements and concepts only and to begin the draft of a protocol, but not actually specify it. There was a lot of consensus on it. It, it. I got a lot of traction on it. I presented it at Storage Developer Conference, at IETF, at RDMA conferences. It's been the, the approach of choice for everybody. And there's been significant work offline, including that IBT effort. Leading up to that, I think it was finally time to update the document uh, in March of 2020, last month. Four years later, um, the authorship from multiple companies this time, the major IWARP uh, manufacturers, if you will, um, updated requirements and concepts, uh, basically refreshing them up over the few years, and added a specific protocol proposal. Still to be written and sort of TBDs in the existing document, the ordering rules, the local interface and local processing sort of round out the discussion. To be discussed today is not to decide, but whether it's appropriate to adopt as an NFS v4 working group item. I'll tell you why. The RDDP work group, what formerly owned IWARP, is no longer active. It was closed down several years ago. So over the years, we've discussed candidates for future adoption of uh, continued IWARP work. One is the TSVWG, the sort of catch all transport area. Fortunately, that's a large catch-all group without a lot of specific RDMA uh, focus or specific RDMA expertise. It, it tends to have quite a few areas uh, represented. Second candidate was an independent proposal. I, we would just continue to publish it as an independent draft, and it would enter the independent RFC stream. It's certainly possible, but it's undesirable to update an existing IETF spec like the IWARP suite in this way. It's Kind of strange, as a matter of fact. The third one that was proposed in the meantime was let's just do it in NFS v4. It's a relevant area. It's in transport. It's storage related, etc. And there's a lot of RDMA expertise here. So it made a lot of sense to me and to others. I'm going to make a tentative recommendation that the NFS v4 workgroup adopt this. Let me just give you a little bit of motivation. Uh, first of all, there is significant NFS v4 workgroup activity uh, in this area. RPC over RDMA is the obvious one. It's an existing effort. It's currently being extended as RPC RDMA v2. There's no actual interdependence between these two uh, possible areas, but there's a strong relation between them. They're both RDMA. They're both data over RDMA, NFS or storage data over RDMA. Second, the PNFS NVMe over fabric use, possibly including PCI Express peer-to-peer -peer transfers. Soren and David Black gave that presentation earlier in this meeting. I was glad to see it. And third is, which I've just discovered, is the push mode layout that Christoph published back in 2017 is actually closely related to this new NVMe over fabric. Uh, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm not referring to that, by the way, in the graph. We refer to so, um, you know, these, these are all related activity that have been um, in the NFS v4 working group over time. So, you know, there's RDMA expertise and there's RDMA development activity. Um, there's strong storage relevance to a persistent memory equipped server on many NFS servers are adopting uh, persistent memory in their uh, storage yep. panoply. Um, it's also relevant to remote shared memory models, that visibility feature that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, is strongly related to remote shared memory. That's not actually storage related, but it's closely related in terms of the fabric requirement. Yeah. So there's current NFS v4 working group activity on this document. I, I CC'd the NFS v4 working group after publishing it last month. 
Um, so there's been some informal discussion about this with, I must say, broad support. Um, comments have been received on the NFSB4 list. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I've deferred response to those comments until this discussion. I thought it was premature to reply on an IETF mailing list to such a thing, but uh, I am uh, prepared to do so. I've also received a bunch of comments off list. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's work pending here to uh, republish that document. Make a final decision on whether the NFS v4 working group takes this on will require obviously consensus among the working group itself, some sort of proposed charter edition. That's probably just a sentence, but it's important. Working group chairs, area director, and other IETF processes all need to be in agreement on this. And we would update the draft instead of as an individual draft, but obviously as a draft NFS v4 or draft IETF NFS v4 uh, retitled. I would propose something along the lines of the name RDMA placement extensions, which I think most accurately describes the extension. And that's my intro. So I'd welcome Great. discussion. Well, I think you've made a good case that this is worth taking on, but I think we have to schedule the, uh, first of all, we have to, figure out the consensus on this. Uh, how long, in your estimation, would it take, would be an adequate time to discuss this and come to consensus on this? Um, well, among the people I've discussed it with to date, everybody has been strongly in favor. There were a couple of messages that went to the mailing list already on this, one from David Black, uh, for instance. Um, I, I'm just trying to remember who else chimed in, but there were a couple of public statements made in support of this idea. Um, I haven't heard anybody say it's a bad idea, so I would expect it would be fairly easy to determine whether we have consensus. Okay, let's say a week or let's say a week or well, a week 10 days, kind of something quick. like that. I think I'll we send send a, time for send everybody to at least out. be aware that the question's being asked, but yeah, I would okay, say so it's maybe during the month of May. It's certainly possible. So this is Magnus. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been a bit. Is this work gonna bring in more people uh, to work on this, or how do you prioritize it related to other already existing work group items or other proposals? I think that's something for the working group to consider because. Uh, yeah, I I can answer the first question. Um, will it bring in more people? I think the answer is yes. The, uh, my co-authors in particular are all representative of companies that have iWarp products. Um, there's one additional co-author who has agreed to, uh, to jump into the next revision, um, who's also an iWarp developer. Um, so I would expect them to join um, at the, uh, this, the discussion, certainly. Um, and I don't know who else might be lurking in the wings, but sure, there are other RDMA interested parties who previously may not have been participating in NFS before, but would hopefully join the discussion. Yeah, that, that's an uh, important point because uh, iWarp is popular, maybe, but uh, you know there are other transfers that are used, uh, at least from my research for the other graph. So. I'm not sure that uh, focusing on iWarp would be a good idea. Well, I mean, th this draft is specifically an iWarp extension. Uh, oh, I think okay. it would be a good item for discussion in the NFS v4 working group if that uh, scope should be expanded as part of the NFS v4. Exactly. exactly. My point. That's my point. I mean, it should expand it. If it's only for iWarp, I don't know if. Uh, Everybody, many people would. Well, the, the proposal, uh, as I mentioned early on, the proposal in the Infiniband Trade Association is almost the same semantic. I would expect the same verbs, for instance. The only difference is that that currently omits verify, which I believe is highly important. Yeah, and from my perspective, I definitely need to think about this and also what to do with the charter, etc. I mean, I agree with you, your assessment that something needs to be done about the charter. It's going to be take this on. Uh, it's a bit far beyond what's than the current NFSV charter allows, I think. Um, 
and and so indeed <coughs> magnus Sorry. yeah magnus uh sh should we have the discussion that for tom to, to open up the discussion while we noodle on whether we consume it uh, i i think it's fine for you to, i mean it's a thing I don't see another venue where you easily can judge if there's in, in interest, etc., and how much people who would be interested in working on this, etc. And I think those are important aspects of this. Uh, but uh, I, I am to say, I, I mean, I want to have a see that we actually, how do we actually get to finishing up the most important work group items, etc., and all these other aspects also. So, uh, and and how does important is this in relation to? But that's I. I think NFS we working group mailing list is fine to discuss this, but uh, so okay, okay. Uh, but but we but then Tom we so start the discussion. Tom would realize we have to have a bigger discussion about whether we can consume it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, these were the areas that I felt might consume it. So, um, the, uh, as a working group. Okay, as, as taking on the work, that's that's the only. I think that's what I see the, the the mechanics of actually taking on the work. Oh, the actual no, the not. actual hands whacking on something relative to other things. Yeah, mechanics of it. The actual. If or, if we were to take on this one, you know, um, then I believe there would be immediate relevance to it. Maybe, maybe not, because uh, we are looking mostly at TCP transport. So. Okay. So I thought you mentioned that a flush extension would be needed for that. Yeah, but yeah, okay. yeah. But uh, no, David, David Black said that's that's actually not relevant. I think I think taking this on would be relevant if we took on push mode. The third, the third bullet here. Right. Yeah. So we have this. We've attempted over a number of years to get. To get this uh, this 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 layout done, and uh, I think uh, I think we need to figure out how to do that. It would be it would certainly be nice. Okay. Just one point before you all hang up. I was not able to uh, access the list, so maybe somebody will have to do the list after the call because I I try to edit it as you mentioned, DP. I edit the deleted, so I have no idea. Everything's fine. Um, a, there was one more thing on the agenda. Sorry, we're at 12.02. Uh, potential work to enable new transports, Chuck Lever. It was 15 minutes. We're over. I agree to drop that today. Okay, didn't hear that. Thank you. No, I just says, I said that right now, so you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Okay, so we're dropping today. Um, I, I, okay, okay. Hey, Magnus, is that okay? We drop. We're dropping an item to finish up. Can we take it to the to the yeah, list yeah. just to start churning it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, from my perspective, it's fine for you to discuss it, but I think you need to keep in mind. I I taking on new work. I actually think you really need to think about. How you prioritize and etc. And you still have a couple of work group items up, up open and ongoing, and and I don't. So it's it's those aspects need to be thought about, and and I think really, yeah. it's not just gobble up more work because that's not going to be <laughs> endear you to me more, but or the other opposite. So it's, um, um, yes, it's fine to discuss things with. While still on individual level and and just interest and, and and trying to understand how important is that this to happen, etc. Right. But um, I think we need to work more about that kind of prioritization list of how do we get things done, etc. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and um, another aspect of this is I I think we or say I will talk to the chairs more later on, etc. But also for the working group is saying. Uh, Looking at the situation, uh, more regular, if you're gonna go to more regular virtual interim now when not gonna be possible to meet that well for at least for a while to keep up maybe pace here and, and resolve things. So think about that. Okay. Yep. 
All right. Um, if there's nothing, Dave, you have anything else? Uh, no. Okay. I I uh, I had taken minutes in Etherpad. I'm going to produce a document and upload it um, to the our uh, doc doc site the meeting minutes and stuff like that. Um, if you guys take a look at it, and if there's anything in there I'm missing or I should add or correct, please do. I'm not really trusting the Etherpad stuff, but it started working again for me. Anyway. Okay, if there's nothing else, Dave, let's call the meeting. Let's do. Any objections? If none, let's go. Thank you, guys. Okay, and I'll upload your slides, Soren. Okay? Thank you very much. Hey, guys. Thank you.